in and as the children are going to children's church we turn our attention to this theme that we're looking at throughout february of the greatest we're following the book of first corinthians we've talked about the greatest family god's people the church about the greatest love that we see displayed for us in christ jesus and today we talk about the greatest story We're reading today from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Did you hear God's word today? Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaimed to you, which you in turn received and which also you stand, through which you are being saved if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers and sisters at one time, many, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles and fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. The Lord always blesses the reading of his word. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word, in which you have chosen to reveal yourself to us. Help us today. Help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to see and to understand our place in this greatest story ever told. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. A small church in a small town in England is excited about their Christmas program. They're doing a big one that year. They were attempting a huge outdoor nativity pageant, Christmas on the farm, with adult actors, live animals, doing it to bless their community. And as they've gathered for one of the rehearsals for the big Christmas on the farm pageant, the pastor reveals the big advertising poster for the event with the title across the top, The Greatest Story Ever Told. Now she is really excited about the poster, but her actors, her church members immediately question the title on the poster. They know the nativity story. But is it really the greatest story ever told? They begin to ask her. Then they begin to tell their own stories that they've heard. Fascinating, interesting stories that they think might be the greatest story ever told. And because this is actually a scene from a BBC comedy series called The Vicar of Dibley, their stories border on the ridiculous but are highly entertaining. And after hearing all of her church people's stories out, the pastor has to remind them what they're really telling in the nativity story, what it's all about, that God actually took on human flesh, actually came and lived among them, that they are still talking about this baby 2,000 years later. Eventually, with her persuasion, she wins them over and they agree that the title, The Greatest Story Ever Told, can stay on the posters. Now, debating in church about the greatest story ever told may make a good comedy scene in a sitcom, but it is a question also that plays out over and over again in our own lives, in our own communities, as we are confronted with the story of God's salvation. Is it merely a good story among many that we can enjoy and learn from, or is it the greatest, truest story ever told that should shape and form our whole lives? 
And this is the very question that the Apostle Paul is dealing with as he is writing his letter to the church in Corinth, Greece. He recounts the story of God's salvation that he says is of first importance, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to CFS Peter, and then to the twelve, and then to many. And he recounts this basic confession of the Christian faith after asking them, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. His reciting of the most basic parts of the greatest story ever told, that Christ is risen, Christ has died, Christ is risen, that Christ will come again, tells us that there are those in the church at Corinth that are questioning whether those basic tenets of the Christian faith are actually true. After all, believing that Jesus raised from the dead would really mean rejecting the stories of the world around them, the culture around them, the very things that they have built their lives around, that this life is all that there is. It would mean rejecting all their culture had told them was true. And for us as well today, when we come to believe that Jesus really is alive, it challenges all of our assumptions about how to live life, everything our culture tells us about what is true. This life is not all there is. Death is not the end. Love is more powerful. There is one who can bend the rules of science because he created them in the first place. And if we are to believe that Jesus really and truly is raised from the dead, it changes everything. The Christian story cannot be one more nice story that we tell ourselves to help make sense of the world along with other stories. It has to be the story that shapes and defines us. It's not that we don't try, that we don't try to just add the Christian story as a nice additional part of our story. Indeed, we try doing that all the time, don't we? It's just an add-on to who we are, another part of our lives, like our favorite sports teams or our hobbies or our career, something that plays a part in defining us. The Corinthian church was trying to do this too. Okay, we can be Christians, we can have church, but we're not really sure we can live like Jesus is really raised from the dead. Because that's kind of weird. That's taking it too far. And when we try to just add Christianity to the rest of our lives, to our own way of looking at things, we end up with something that really isn't the Christian faith at all. If we can't really believe that Jesus is actually raised from the dead and that we can be too, well, we can still play at church. We'll just have to be a little more creative. We can come to church and play, and on Easter Sunday morning we can still have services, we can still sing, but we'll have to listen to a sermon about the virtues of rising early in the morning like Mary Magdalene, rather than about the resurrection. We try it, though. It sounds like nonsense, but we want to just tack our faith on to the rest of our lives and act like it doesn't change everything. It's all or nothing. Either Jesus is really still alive and at work in our world, transforming us, raising us from the dead. Really, it's that this is the greatest story ever told. Because if it's not, I've got easier ways of learning moral virtues and about how to rise early in the morning to get things done than reading the Bible and coming to church. But I believe, along with the Apostle Paul and Mary Magdalene and the 500 who saw him and so many more after them, that Jesus really is alive, that Jesus really is raised from the dead, that Christ has died, that Christ is risen, and that Christ will come again. And this changes everything about how we look at the world. This is the greatest story ever told. It's a precious gift that we've received of God's self-revelation, and that we can really believe. It is, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, something of first importance. And why is it of first importance? Why is the Christian story of death and resurrection the greatest story ever told? 
what makes its formative power for us greater than those other really compelling stories that we like to tell, that capture our attention and our imaginations. I mean, we've got some good stories in our culture, right? We've got some good stories. We have Star Wars and Harry Potter. We live in an era where fantastic, well-told stories are easily delivered to our homes in Amazon boxes and over the internet through Netflix. There are a lot of good stories out there that can shape and form our imaginations and how we live. So why is the story of the Bible the greatest story ever told? Why it? It is the first importance story, the story that we summarize and when we say what we believe, when we say that simple phrase that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again, because it's true. It's true in the way in which the other stories are true. It's story is true in that it has symbolic meanings that intersect with our lives and teach us how to really live. It's true that way, but it's also literally really true that God really did actually come into the world in Jesus Christ that God in Jesus Christ really did take our place die our death rise again and live our life and open the doorway to us of life everlasting it is true in every way the story this greatest story is true And the greatest story ever told and the claims it makes are the most important claims about the most important things in life. Life Life-changing truths, society-changing truths, universe-changing truths. The greatest story ever told doesn't present itself as a nice, tame religion that makes nice, moral, kind people, which will make a nice addition to our individual personalities and to our society. No. The greatest story ever told tells us that there is one God, and that that one God is active in the world, that this God indeed loves us, and this God loves us so much that God has left God's own throne to come and live in poverty with us, to suffer and die and be raised again to change our realities. The greatest story ever told tells us that resurrection Jesus' resurrection opens to us the possibility of life everlasting to us. And what, pray tell, could be more important than everlasting life, than death being defeated, than life abundant here and now being possible? But the greatest story ever told is not just some detached, true, but in some faraway historical nature story. No, it is a living story story. When we live and breathe and have our being in that we find ourselves within, it is the truest story of the whole world, revealed to us by love, by the one who created the cosmos. And as the people of God, we recognize the Christian story as the defining story of the universe, and we seek to live in accordance with it, both as individuals and together as a church. In our Bible passage from 1 Corinthians, we read today, Paul twice says that the work of Jesus Christ is in accordance with the Scriptures. The Scriptures are an account of God's revelation to the world, and they are a living text. A living text that the Holy Spirit keeps breathing through, speaking through, working through, to speak to us as individuals, to shape us as a community of God. The story of the Scriptures, then, isn't one that ended in 90 A.D. when The Apostle John finished writing Revelation and rolled up the scroll. No, the Scriptures keep revealing God, keep forming us to be God's people. The Holy Spirit keeps using them. God keeps speaking to us of this most excellent way we heard about a few chapters earlier, which is love. Our United Methodist Confession of Faith says, We believe that the Holy Bible, the Old and New Testament, reveals the Word of God so far as it is necessary for our salvation. It's to be received through the Holy Spirit as the true rule and guide for faith and practice. The greatest story ever told is alive, and we are still receiving it through God's work of the Holy Spirit in our midst as a guide for our faith and for our practice, a guide for our very lives. It reveals God enough for us to know 
what is necessary for our salvation. And the greatest story ever told reminds us, tells us that we need salvation and what's necessary for it. Yes, we need to be rescued. We need to be saved. We need to be made whole. Now, we try to run from this fact. Humanity tries to run from this fact, even though it is quite obvious. It's obvious that we all mess up, that we're all broken. We've all chosen our own way of doing things. It's obvious that we will all die. We need help. And the greatest story ever told reminds us of our need for the God who created us, for God's redemptive work in Jesus Christ to bring us back to God, back to life. We all too easily get caught up in ourselves, in the compelling stories the world is telling around us, and forget until it's too late our need both to receive and to share salvation. Yes, our whole lives can get caught up and this greatest story ever told. Well, whether we choose to let them get caught up in the story or not, the truth is, is that it's the truth of the world we live in, God's world. We may choose to see the truth and live it out in the way that we live, and in living in harmony with the God of the universe, the God who is love, the God who has defeated death and offers to us life and forgiveness and peace and joy and means to all who would come living life in tune with the resurrection makes all the difference. We can, like those nativity scene actors in the English town, sit around and debate whether this is the greatest story ever told or not. And being like God, we are made in God's image, possessing responsibility and agency and the capacity to love means we get to choose. We get to choose how we live our lives. We get to choose what we think is the most compelling story out there about the world and how we live. We can fail to choose anything as a guide for our living and just go with what's around us, with what's current. We can choose the narratives presented by our culture or by consumerism or humanism or modernism or atheism or just good old-fashioned, what do I feel like doing today-ism. Or we can choose to embrace God's self-revelation to us of what is true about God's world, about us, about the power of Jesus Christ and the resurrection, and live into that. And we can go ahead and put up the poster, the poster for our upcoming performance that says, The Greatest Story Ever Told. Because you see, we don't have to dress up like Mary and Joseph or the wise men or the shepherds to tell the greatest story ever told because we are already living in it. We are already living in God's story and the way that we live our lives. The way we demonstrate what we believe to be true, the way we demonstrate that we believe that Jesus is alive, this can be for the world to see a, a passion play a living out of the greatest story ever told where people can see and hear and understand that indeed Jesus is alive. And so brothers, sisters, let's really believe. Let's not just add on our faith as another part of who we are, but let us let the truth as it is in God define us, shape us, Make us see everything differently, that we might live in tune with the God who is writing our whole story. Let us pray. God, here we are in your presence today. Give us grace beyond ourselves. Where we struggle and doubt, help us to believe where we don't live our lives in a way that's integrated and makes sense with what we say we believe, forgive us and show us a more excellent way. Where we have come to rely on ourselves instead of the Holy Spirit, forgive us and by the Spirit's power, make our lives to be a part of the performance of this greatest story ever told, that God is saving the world. Come, Holy Spirit, in our midst. Transform us, we pray. 
Amen. And so, brothers and sisters in church, as we gather in God's name, we retell and we reenact this greatest story ever told over and over again. This story of the greatest love of Jesus. Jesus who offered himself up for our sake. Jesus who on the night he was betrayed took bread, broke the bread, gave thanks to the Father and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. And who in like manner took the cup and said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we pray today, Lord, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world your body, redeemed by your blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. So I invite you today to come to the Lord's table. To come be a part, not only of this retelling of this true story, but of the living out of this true story into the future. That we might be a part, sustained by Christ's own sacrifice for us. To keep telling, to keep living keep empowering this greatest story ever told. We'll have two serving stations down here and a serving station in the balcony. This morning we have uh, new communion cups, so they're a little bit different than what you're used to. Uh, You'll peel off the top for the bread and then flip it over for the juice on the bottom. And if you need gluten-free, those are in the glass bowls in the baskets. The Lord invites you. Will you come to the table? Will you live out this greatest story ever told?